the end result of fast production is that cheaper, inferior garments that you don't want to wear for a long time. And we've all kind of become conditioned to think, oh, well, you know, there's a hole in that t-shirt. Well, it was only $5. I'll just go and buy another one. Or, you know, what's the point in getting this jacket repaired? It's old season anyway. You know, I want something else new. And when you're on that kind of cycle of trying to satiate something, we're not even sure what it is with a dopamine hit from buying a new t-shirt or a new jacket, um, which is all, you know, kind of fed into by social media and the internet, uh, it starts to become a really kind of toxic and endless cycle, um, you know, machine that's very hard to get off of. Welcome to Inside Ideas with me, Mark Buckley. We will be speaking to regenerative futurists, game changers, on systemic change and about desirable futures with those who want to see us on the right side of history. Brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Lucian Tonti is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, the wonderful team at Island Press, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Lucian is a journalist, author, and regenerative fashion consultant. She is the fashion editor of the Saturday paper, a regular contributor to The Guardian, where she writes the weekly series Closet Clinic. Her writing also appears in Australian Vogue. Her first book, Sundressed, I have a copy right here, Natural Fabrics and the Future of Clothes, was released in Australia in July and will be published by Island Press very soon, if it's not already out, I think it's we're right on the cusp of a few days. Um, in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom this year, Luciana has worked in sustainable and luxury fashion in Melbourne, Sydney, London, and Paris. It's so great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. It's really good, and I'm glad you could make it. I'm so glad at Island Press that uh, the wonderful team has uh, connected us, put us together so that we could have this discussion. It's uh, a passion of mine uh, as well, as I would imagine it is as yours. I want to start out first, and, and you, you discuss this in the book, kind of right in the beginning. You talk about the you know, the pandemic and how kind of the lockdown, um, did that really help you to, to write this book? And, but also did it kind of nudge you to, to make sure it was birthed to the world? Yeah. I, in, I mean, really like I, I, the book came out of the, the opportunity to slow down that the pandemic presented because I was living in Paris. Um, and when COVID kicked off, my mom's a doctor and she was like, I, I think you should come home and just see what happens. So when I got back to Australia, um, my business was in Paris and so I wasn't working and I had a real moment to kind of reflect and pause and do more research around sustainability and fashion and think about kind of what a truly sustainable industry looks like. And so um, if I hadn't had that kind of slowdown time, because Australia had some pretty intense lockdowns, um, uh, yeah, I might never have had the opportunity to write Sundressed. And also there was, it was helped, wasn't it? Because I was, you know, locked away for 12 months, kind of just focusing on, on this piece of work, which might've been harder to do if I knew everybody else was ar around having a good time. <laughs> um, but everyone was, you know, we, we all were going through the same thing. And also I think that kind of seismic change that the world went through, um, it certainly gave me reason, and I think a lot of people reason to pause and reflect on the way we were living and look for those kind of really big solutions to the climate crisis and, um, you know, kind of um, a different way of um, approaching modern life. So 
I know you've spoken about regenerative fashion previously, but it kind of in, in ties to the lockdown, the pa pandemic, the kind of the pause and, and, and the things that you just described. Do you think not only that, but the kind of the bubbling of the trend of the discussions that we've heard for probably decades in the fashion industry, not only about fast fashion and, and kind of w where the future is going, that that was expedited, pushed forward, or kind of came under a, a bigger microscope during during that time of pause. And, and kind of, we also saw a lot of logistical problems globally um, that were kind of a ripple effect tied to not just sustainability, but also um, and climate change, uh, but also the pandemic and how we were in this mass lockdown. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the fashion industry for a long time, as you said, you know, had been talking about needing to slow down and needing to change. And, you know, it's an industry um, based around speed, the speed of trend cycles, the speed of production. Um, and we were doing four fashion weeks a year, which seems crazy. And now, um, you know, they're embracing um, and, and as COVID kicked off, suddenly there was this outpouring from the fashion industry saying that it was unsustainable. It was too fast. We were producing too many collections, traveling too much and all these things. So um, there was a real moment of reckoning that happened, especially because suddenly it was clear how disparate the industry supply chain was, how many different countries a garment would kind of touch before it was finally produced. And the, you know, COVID really showed us um, that none of, you know, Australia certainly wasn't self-reliant when it came to fashion, neither was the US, you know, uh, and we, that, get, you know, gave us real pause to think about what we were actually doing, you know, how um, disconnected we are from the origins of the garment. You know, we grow 90% of the world's fine apparel wool in Australia, but we can't mill it ourselves. We grow cotton in Australia, but we can't process it ourselves. Um, you know, and because over the course of decades, we had slowly outsourced all of our production, manufacturing garments, uh, you know, everything to um, other parts of the world. Um, and we were extremely reliant on the ability to spend everything everywhere whenever we wanted to. And um, that's not a sustainable way to live. It's not a sustainable way to run a business. I don't even think it's a smart way to run a business, to be totally honest with you. So COVID really was, um, as much as it was an enormous challenge and it was, you know, really tragic um, and a hardship, it also really was a wake-up call. And that was some, and that's something that I... Um, I was very grateful for, for the fashion industry at the beginning, but now that we're kind of open again and back to normal life, we haven't actually realized that much change, but we've kind of snapped back, but we, we have started some important conversations. So um, that's something good at least. <laughs> well, I, I'm very thankful for you for uh, starting those conversations and also addressing them in your book. And, and um, I, I'm definitely on your side and, and an advocate, so don't feel attacked by any of the questions. And, um, you you mentioned that um, we we couldn't process the wool, we couldn't process and uh, and that, and then and then you kind of answered it, and it's because the production had been all outsourced, right? Um, and and then and then you even went deeper, and you said. And I don't think that's the right way to do business, if you ask me. And, and so uh, let's talk about that. I mean, we're, we're going in, in deep right in the beginning. And, and that's good because how, how would it not only be right? Is it just a bottom line thing? It's fast fashion, cheap, uh, fast and good and, and all over the world. Is, is that why we've come to this? And, and that's affected this local production, better fashion, longer lasting fashion, more sustainable, better for humanity, better for the environment. Is that kind of a vicious cycle we got into because of cost and fast fashion or, or how did the, how did we get there? And what are your thoughts around this specifically for Australia, but then what you're seeing globally and also what you've, you've, you've seen in the research in your book? Yeah. So 
you know, it, it wasn't that long ago when we had thriving garment industries in, you know, in America, in um, Europe, not quite so decimated, but certainly Australia's garment industry is, um, you know, it really, it wasn't until kind of the 70s and the 80s that uh, we started to reduce um, tariffs, which were placed on to imported goods so that and they were they can kind of had the effect of protecting the local garment industry um certainly in australia and so as um free trade kind of took hold all over the world and those tariffs got slashed it gave companies the opportunity to outsource production to countries in the global south where wages and environmental regulations um were much lower so uh in australia that really um, devastated the garment industry. And I, I know something similar happened um, in America as well, where all of a sudden we went from having a skilled workforce, we went from having technology and infrastructure and factories and a community of people who could, you know, could make anything and make it at an extremely high quality, um, lost their jobs. Um, and, and it was cost that drove those decision-making for, um, for designers and, because they, you know, if one person does it, then all of a sudden everybody's trying to compete on cost. But what's interesting is that there's this very um, established designer in Australia called Lee Matthews, and she's been around for 25 years. And she told me that the decision she made to outsource production when she moved it all to China, well, you know, and other parts of, um, you know, Vietnam and Bangladesh and places like that, <clears throat> she I actually don't know if she makes it in those places, but I know it's not all in China. Um, but she basically said she started producing way more product and which meant that she needed to have, you know, more staff on the website, more shops, more, you know, distributors and all of this stuff. So it immensely increased the workload, but that it actually didn't make the business more profitable. So they might have been making more money overall, but what she was actually taking home out of that um, wasn't significantly increased. So that's kind of she's a high-end designer so what happened over those kind of first years in the in the 90s was you know all of a sudden everybody could access clothes much cheaper when we get to the 2000s and the final tariffs were removed that was kind of the um onset of the internet in those kind of that first decade of the 2000s and what happened then was uh we saw kind of global global companies like h&m and zara and boohoo um you know, figure out how to kind of play the logistics of the of the supply chain. So rather than just dropping, say, four collections a year, they could start to turn around product in three to six weeks. And what that meant was they could be delivering new stuff to store over, you know, um, very, very quickly and so that they could capitalize on the trends. And so when we have the internet and all of a sudden fashion shows um, that used to be private events kind of can be beamed around the world globally in a matter of seconds, and the ability of these massive chains to pick up on what the trends were in Paris and then be able to get it onto the rack in three weeks. That's when you start to see the cycles of the trends really speed up. And um, this notion of fast fashion as we, as we know it today was kind of invented. And what's happened since then is just an acceleration because we have more technology, we have more social media, you know, we have faster internet, we have faster delivery services, turnaround times, everything. And so, now we have arrived at a place where, what, which we've described as ultra fast fashion, where companies like Shein are delivering literally tens of thousands of SKUs to store or to their website every week. And what that means is they can see what's popular, what's selling through, and then they can turn it around faster again. So it's this complete acceleration in how much we produce and consume. The stat is something like we are consuming 60% more clothes now than we were compared to the year 2000. And by the year 2030, that'll have increased by another 60%. So in real terms for, you know, the average person, that's a lot more garments. And it's a lot more garments that are um, being not just produced, but that are also being thrown away because the quality has declined. The um, end result of fast production is that cheaper, inferior garments that you don't want to wear for a long time. And you're kind of, we've all kind of become conditioned to think, oh, well, you know, there's a hole in that T-shirt. Well, it was only $5. I'll just go and buy another one. Or, you know, what's the point in getting this jacket repaired? It's old season anyway. You know, I want something else new. And when you're on that kind of cycle of trying to um, 
satiate something. We're not even sure what it is with a dopamine hit from buying a new t-shirt or a new jacket, um, which is all, you know, kind of fed into by social media and the internet. Uh, it starts to become a really kind of toxic and endless cycle, um, you know, machine that's very hard to get off of. There's, there's two things I want to go, uh, kind of two paths that I want to go. They're both connect, they both connect in the end, but they're, they're a little bit different. Um, it, in the last, I don't know, seven years, it's been, become more and more trend, especially during the pandemic where they're taking fashion, almost knockoffs, basically pictures of, you know, Ralph Lauren products or Gucci or, or whatever they are. And, and uh, you just order it from this online shop and, and there's thousands and you know, hundreds of thousands, literally, and you do it and it's kind of this manufacturer on de demand. It's like a, um, a, a cheaper process of production, um, but it's a lot more rapid, but it's this on demand type of a clothing, even though they're, you're stealing someone else's pattern or, or the, the design or the cut of it. Um, I don't really want to get into the, the legalities of that, but I want to get into, does that make the industry more sustainable? Does it make it less sustainable? Does it make it uh, worse or perpetuate the problem? When we see the r a rise of that kind of on demand, when you see it, when you want it, and then you order it immediately online and, you know, a couple of days, a week later, it's, Done, quickly done up and shipped out from wherever. Yeah, look, it, it certainly makes the industry less sustainable because we, you know, um, when we're producing that much stock that quickly, um, there's not the time to investigate what's happening all the way down the supply chain. So really, when we want to know if a garment is sustainable, we have to look at the source of the raw material. Um, hopefully it's a farm and it's not an oil refinery. Um, we want to know what's going on on the farm. We want to know, um, you know, how the cotton balls are being turned into yarn, how the yarn is being woven into fabric and how the fabric's being turned into a garment, what's happened at every stage, what chemicals were used, how the workers were treated, what kind of energy is being used to power the mill, the factory, et cetera. Uh, so, and you can't do that when you're just churning garments out because, you don't even know, you, you know, most of the time you've got no idea where your raw material will source from because you're, you're ordering off a, a spreadsheet. So certainly it makes the industry less sustainable in a very material sense, but it also makes the industry less sustainable because if we want to have a sustainable fashion industry, we have to dramatically reduce the amount of clothes that we make and that we consume. And what that means, what that requires us to do is to... Um, we need to be buying less, wearing what we already own more, and only investing in pieces that we're going to be able to keep and wear for a really, really long time. And um, what that requires is us, you know, kind of tapping out of this cycle that's um, really drawing on some really basic um, psychological principles um, to try to get us to feel like we're not enough and that we need something more and that maybe that new dress, that $13 dress is the thing that's going to, um, you know, uh, help. So, and what I mean when I say basic psychology, it's probably not that basic, but um, so you kind of have to think of it. Fashion exists in, uh, so our brains are wired to perceive threats, right? So um, that's kind of, um, you know, we're kind of constantly scanning and looking and being like, is there anything here that's going to, that's going to hurt me, that's going to affect me in a negative way. And because fashion exists in a space where it might mean that we are um, accepted or cool or desired, it occupies a part of our brain that is very susceptible to fear and very susceptible to being played on. So what these companies are doing when they rip off something on the runway in Paris and put it into stores is they're like, they're trying to make you believe that by having the latest thing that looks like the Marc Jacobs thing or is the Marc Jacobs thing um, that, you know, 
your life will improve. You'll, you'll, you might walk into the party and, you know, you'll meet someone new, your friends will think you're, will want, you'll be more popular. And, you know, it's, it's these really kind of base level kind of high school um, emotions that it's tapping into, but we all experience it and we're all susceptible to it. And when we're feeding those um, fears by buying the new thing, and then the new thing isn't satiating them because it's, you know, if we play the thinking all the way through, of course, buying a new dress doesn't change the way my friends treat me. My friends treat me a certain way because they love me. They don't keep, they don't care what dress I'm wearing. Um, you know, we, we search and we reach for something else again. And so really the challenge of sustainable fashion and the challenge of consuming in a more conscious way is really, you know, checking those impulses when they arise you know, spending the time looking at your wardrobe, thinking about the garments that you do enjoy wearing, that you keep for a long time, that you want to, um, that you uh, enjoy and take um, pride in owning, and then, you know, try to replicate those purchases. And you're probably going to have to spend a little bit more money if you want the quality to keep them, you know, to wear them over and over again over um, decades. So we need to kind of re-educate our thinking so that we know we're saving up for those investment pieces and we're slowing down and we're um you know checking ourselves when we you know we get tempted by the new thing like it might have some kind of promise that um you know and really um and really be more considered in the way that we're buying our clothes now, this isn't the second line of questioning, but you've opened up another pathway that I want to ask you about to see how, you know, so w with that pause that we all had, uh, did, did online purchases of clothing go up and actually an increase in the market? Um, because I, I was kind of understanding worldwide and what you, what you see, um, in general is that people were going back to wearing their pajamas all day and, and, and stretch pants and, and lounge wear, you know, because they were at home, there wasn't a lot of places to go, especially the office. And so they were enjoying some of those comforts, but did that mean once now that we've emerged and we've, we've come out of this for the, for the greater part, um, that they purchase more or that they, 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 got a deeper look at kind of, uh, no, I can do with less, or I just wore the same piece all the time, or I, what, what kind of are the trends or what did we see during that time? Mm. So, uh, I mean, definitely spending was suppressed during the pandemic because, you know, people weren't working, people were scared. That's what happens. We saw a boost, uh, across the board in, athleisure wear so you know leggings track pants <laughs> sweats and then jumpers you know things that are good for the couch um but but overall you know obviously spending was spending was down and then once people started to come out of lockdown um we saw we've we have seen an increase you know people want to express themselves again they want to wear with lots of color was one of the big trends they called it dopamine dressing um, and now we're kind of seeing a push towards more um, kind of um, slightly more formal clothes than we had before. But also, you know, we've come out into um, a cost of living crisis. So it's the, across the board, it's, it's, tri it's tricky for retailers and designers at the moment. Um, it's not so straightforward that, you know, we're out and we're spending again. Um, there's been, you know, it's kind of cyclical. So uh as the industry the fashion industry has absolutely kind of come back full force um and which is a shame because it's like we 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 didn't learn anything um but i think for people in their in their day-to-day -day lives the world really did change and i don't know about um you know where you are in germany but Certainly the people that I'm talking to here, everybody feels a little bit different as much as we're excited to be back together again and able to travel again and, you know, able to throw parties and, and have a really good time. There is a sense of um, looking at the world in a slightly different way that isn't so conducive to just kind of 
um, embracing consumption. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's a very good answer okay. to you. The, no, that, no, no, that's good. Because uh, obviously you, it's not only the circles you're in and, and you, you write that as uh, about it as well, but in, have researched it in your book as well. And so you, you would be someone very good uh, and wise about the pulse of, of what's going on during this time. Um, and it's, it's important to know the second line of my question um, is, is really, so in, in Australia, we'll, we'll speak about that specifically, but I see the tr trend worldwide is really, you know, you talked about cotton, you talked about, about wool and are those one, those are kind of crops mm -hmm. tied to some form of agriculture or uh, um, it ties there. Um, and which is a, a big, huge strain on the environment and, and how we do it. But then we ship those end goods off around the world for someone else to do the the production processing and maybe even manufacturing before either sending it back or then sending it to the next destination as it gets distributed around the world. And it's it's a little bit like a resource curse. I, I kind of want to know specifically how much of those products, if it is a hundred percent, is it above 90% that are leaving Australia somewhere else because the production and facilities aren't there. And are those actually turned into commodity crops in that process? Is it kind of, is that cotton is traded like a commodity? Is that, wool traded like a commodity and um because that's important to kind of go deeper to pull back the, the carpet or the rug a little bit uh, the curtains a little bit further to get the full view of of what's actually going on what kind of a system we've created especially in australia yeah so <clears throat> so uh, like uh, I can't the, the stat of the wool we make 90% of the world's apparel wool here and we're exporting about 85% of it to 90% of it greasy so what that means is it goes offshore before it's even been washed um, and we've got the capacity I think I've gotten that wrong I think China buys 85% of our wool clip and then there's another 10% that goes to other places. Italy buys 5%. So, so we're, we're exporting upwards of 90% of the wool before it's even been, it's called scouring um, when you clean the wool. Yeah. So we have one small facility in Australia, in Adelaide, who's capable of doing kind of end to end with the wool. Um, but really what they're making is a, a really tiny portion of it. So the wool wool's an interesting one because um, it's such a wonderful fiber um, and it can be farmed in ways that regenerate landscapes. Not all wool farming is done like that, but a lot of it is. Uh, but China is the biggest market for wool in the world. So um, not only do they buy most of our wool clip and, and manufacture most of um, the wool clip onshore there, they also um, have a population that is consuming it at retail because you need two things to sell wool. You need a really cold climate and you need an affluent population. So Australia, um, we're not, it's not cold enough here and we don't have enough people to buy as much wool as we're producing. So um, there is an argument for that relationship and the dependency of that relationship with China because we want a thriving wool industry. Uh, and, you know, it's something that we're very proud of um, to have as, as such a large portion of the market. However, uh, should we have more capacity for local processing here? Would it be better for the environment? Would it be better for Australia? Yeah, because, you know, when the wool goes offshore greasy, we're getting it, we're selling it at, you know, its lowest um, value. And every other process after that adds value. So China has a very thriving industry there because it's not like when they buy, you know, a bottle of Australian, you know, bottles of Australian wine, which is just like put on the table and sold, it, you know, they are adding value at every step along the way. So they're creating jobs and a thriving wool economy um, off the back of the raw commodity that we're um, exporting to them from here. Setting up um, wool processing in Australia is complicated. So 
we don't have the infrastructure anymore. You need, obviously you need facilities for scouring and carding and spinning and knitting. Um, and I had the CEO of Australian Wool Innovation tell me that it would take 15 to 20 years for us to have the capacity to process just 5% of the wool clip here. Um, I still think that's a worthwhile path to go down. And there's a few reasons why local processing is important. Um, the environmental cost of shipping is one of them, obviously, but also, um, and the, you know, um, I was going to say sovereignty, which is not unrelated, but you know, the having the ability and the capacity to be self-reliant as a country is important too. You know, having the ability to um, feed and clothe yourselves without relying on um, uh, international imports is is important because uh, you know, with climate change and now that we've experienced a global pandemic, I don't want to scare anyone, but you know, it's likely that there will be another event where supply chains are shut down all over the world. So it's in our interests, it's in everybody's interests to reinvest in their own local industries and local manufacturing. The other side of that, the argument is, oh, and it, the, the stats are similar for cotton. So we, we, we produce about 6% of the world's cotton. We gin it here and then most of it goes offshore. There's very a tiny, tiny, tiny portion that can actually all be processed in Australia. Um, and there are conversations happening around that as well, uh, around changing that as well. So the environmental argument of being able to process your fibres within proximity to where they were grown uh, is, is basically, you know, this kind of extreme reversal of big agriculture and, and, um, globalization and so the the two forces aligning in terms of um the industrial revolution and industrial agriculture um kind of moved through and this is a very crude um <laughs> a very crude analysis and i'm sure some historian would call me up on it but you know as as one took off so did the other so as the world industrialized and globalized so did agriculture change and it became about producing more and more at scale using chemicals and you know other artificial things like machinery to really exploit and take as much from the land as possible and so the argument is that when we bring back local production and local manufacturing um, and uh, we we also bring back more local farming of the raw materials because um, we can see the link and the connection between the two things we um, create localized economies so that you know the the cotton farmer in Queensland has a relationship to the cotton mill in Adelaide and um, that proximity you know brings about a certain level of stability in terms of our economy but also in terms of our environment because if you're a cotton farmer that's interested in protecting his land you're also going to be want to work with a factory who's interested in you know protecting the environment around them as well so it's about control over the supply chain uh, and, and also about um, uh, bringing these things back under the umbrella so that we can kind of, um, <clears throat> it, you know, so that it's, it's sensory in a way because <clears throat> at, at every point when we are outsourcing, we're losing sight of what's happening to the river next to that factory. We're losing sight of what's happening on that cotton farm and, when we can bring it all back within close proximity to us, we have a much better idea of what damage we're actually doing to the environment every time we buy a cotton t-shirt and throw it away because it was only $5. I, I, I absolutely love that. And I don't uh, uh, disagree with you at all. Matter of fact, um, you're hundred percent right. The, the agricultural revolution was definitely a precursor to the industrial revolution paved the way for that entire process. And it's also a, a big part of this, you know, the, this um, discussion as, as well as, and, and led into all the things we've said. When I was younger, there was a big, um, a, a great book called the jungle, but it was also talking about the, the, um, sewing uh, industry, you know, in, in New York and, and how child labor and, you know, we've all heard the stories around the world where um, the clothing industry is, is 
you know, done horrific things around uh, child labor or also just uh, production standards where the facilities are sweatshops and, and things like this. Um, and it's, it's always kind of taken a back seat to environment and sustainability, but those two go hand in hand. If you're paying someone an unfair wage or the processes of how you produce is not local in, in I don't even want to say control, but kind of in your eyesight, in your surrounding, in, in a local uh, type of a way so that you can see what's going on and how it's being processed and treated and manufactured and produced. It's really easy to kind of distance yourself from the natural capital, the true cost, if it's being done fairly, if the people who are involved in that process are being treated fairly. So I really like that you see that in, in, in our world before, and I don't know, uh, I didn't read this out anywhere in the book really, but um, Gandhi had two big, huge things uh, in, in his life. And one was around salt in the production and getting salt. And that's why he did his fast and treks down to, to produce salt to kind of, um, in an easy way to piss off colonialism and, and, and show them, you know, different. But the other one was to make his own clothing, to spin his own cotton and to gin it uh, and to do different things of producing that it was a huge process because at that time, there was shirts and all sorts of things that were done in the United Kingdom and, um, to, to treat countries and people unfairly and in the process of something that we, we all need, like food and clothing so uh, and sustainable. And so I, I really think it's unique how such a vital thing as, as wool and cotton, and, and I'm sure there's other things in Australia and also all around the world, um, that we could rein in a little bit uh, closer and have a, a closer eye at, but most most of us don't get that 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 view behind the curtain or the understanding of how complex these systems are that we've created and how they they really function and what our role is in them uh, overall. So I think we've started it out great, even though we're already pretty deep into it. Um, but, and I think you've given the good setup, but, but why is regenerative agriculture uh, the future of the fashion industry? What, what do those two have to do with each other? Oh yeah, okay. No, no small questions here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so look, uh, okay, so, so the fashion industry, um, to make clothes, we take a lot of uh, resources out of the ground and we use a lot more resources to turn them into, into garments. And so at the moment, the way that happens is over 60% of our clothes are made from polyester, which is oil um, that, and turn, which is turned into plastic and then melted down and spun into, uh, into fabric. So um, when we talk about decarbonizing the world, we have to get off polyester. Like that's just like a, a very simple equation. Um, and then when we talk about natural fibers, so when we're talking cotton, linen, silk, wool, cashmere, um, cotton, linen, silk, wool, cashmere, and hemp, uh, what's happening on those farms where they're grown, uh, when we're using the principles of industrial agriculture, which is spraying lots of nitrous oxide, uh, um, spraying, spraying lots of pesticides, tilling the soil, using big machinery to harvest, to rip up the crop at the end of the season. Um, we're talking about more exploitation of the land uh, to make these garments. So when we, for a long time, the fashion industry has talked about sustainability. And what that really does is mitigate those harms. So you might switch from polyester to recycled polyester or from um, cotton to organic cotton. And that's really about reducing the emissions and reduce, reducing the, you know, toxic chemicals that are being released along the supply chain. And that's all great. But what regenerative agriculture offers is the opportunity to actually regenerate and rehabilitate 
those landscapes where those where the raw materials of the natural fibers are grown so with polyester we don't have any opportunity to or with polyester or nylon or any other synthetic we don't have the opportunity to um to drive positive outcomes like we do with the natural fibers and what i mean by positive outcomes in terms of regenerative agriculture are we don't have the opportunities to restore soil health to bring back biodiversity to um, uh, recreate life, to restore life to these landscapes. We don't have the opportunity to give farmers a different way of operating their land. So really what regenerative agriculture does is it um, invests in these communities and the landscapes on which they're farming and it restores them to a, a different kind of time. It invests in the power of nature to kind of uh, rehabilitate and and literally regenerate and what that means is that we go from having cotton farms where the soil is degraded so it's releasing stores of carbon into the atmosphere it, it might be desertifying to a landscape where the soil is rich in nutrients healthy soil he healthy soil stores carbon which is also a really wonderful thing um, we can bring back um, pollinators like bees and birds to restore ecosystem functionality and to make sure the land is, um, you know, visibly and audibly kind of brimming with life. Um, you restore healthy water cycles because healthy soils also store water, um, which is makes the landscape more resilient to fires, to floods, to, um, you know, all these other kind of extreme weather events. And the, you know, one of the most wonderful things about farming in this way is that it allows farmers to get off the harmful chemicals that they've been using because of industrial agriculture. And that's kind of the chemicals are toxic, literally, in one very literal way, they're toxic, but they're also, um, they come at a really high price. And it means that farmers for decades have been chasing their tails because they're in debt to chemical companies. And the only way to get out of the debt is to buy more chemicals, to spray the land, to produce more crops in this kind of artificial way. And it's killing their soils, it's killing the landscapes. And so there's kind of, once they get into this cycle, there's kind of no way off. It's spend a lot of money on chemicals, uh, put the chemicals on the ground, create the crops, oh, the soils died again, we need more chemicals. And um, that's why we're seeing, you know, all over the world, the mental health of farmers is in um, and in serious decline. And so I, you know, so regenerative agriculture has this immense power for rehabilitating the earth and also, you know, giving these farmers um, a healthier and much more um, profitable livelihood, which is, you know, a really, um, really positive, wonderful, beautiful thing. And then how this relates to the fashion industry is even more exciting because, uh, you know, we talked at the beginning of, of the podcast about how we need to be wearing our clothes for longer, we need to enjoy them more, we need higher quality clothes. So guess what? Polyester, uh, because it's made from oil, has a very complicated relationship with oil and with sweat, which means that if you if you spill something on polyester or if you sweat in it, it will hold onto that odor or that stain and it won't let it go. So what does that equal? That equals a really not very durable garment, Right. And it also, not to mention, is really uncomfortable on the skin because it's plastic. So um, it makes you sweat. It doesn't keep you warm. It, it's, you know, all of these awful things. So we need polyester out of the fashion industry and out of the garments that we wear. And we need to be wearing clothes made of natural fibers because they are, they thermoregulate. Uh, they are more beautiful. They're more durable. And um, they feel so much better against your skin, which means that you enjoy wearing them and you want to wear them more. And so what we have with regenerative agriculture is this ability to farm these natural fibers in this um, really positive way. And so we can have beautiful clothes that are also giving back and regenerating the environment, which is pretty powerful, um, in my opinion. <laughs> It is extremely powerful, and I, I, I love how you, you sum that up and, and give us the deeper insight of what it means because it's, it's a big process, but a lot of people don't really look at what's all involved and how the downstream of that. Um, are you also seeing 
I mean, there's there's definitely in what we're talking about. There's an overarching theme of kind of what the solution should be long term for us. We're, we're, it's staring us right in the face. But I, I really want to know: Are you seeing that um, regenerative fashion, basically those made with wool, cotton, hemp, and, and um, what was the other one? Cotton, silk? wool, hemp. Yeah. yeah. Silk, uh, wool, yeah, flax, cashmere. The, um, that after they've been purchased down in the long room, so I don't know what they call that in the industry is the last mile or the, you know, once they're in your hands, then um, the impact on the environment or long term when you go to wash those, you're not putting, hopefully, plastics back into the water system because you're using the wrong detergent or, or things, or because they wear better, they wear longer, they don't uh, get, get the sweat and stink and other things in them that when, when you go to reuse them or to, you know, wear them again after you, you've showered and that, that the long-term effect on the environment and, and kind of, that it keeps and can be used for decades, um, that that is better than what we're seeing from fast fashion and industrial uh, produced clothes that is done done in the, in the wrong way, in a bad way. Yeah, absolutely. The microfiber pollution is a really uh, big concern. So uh, it, there's um, every time we wash um, polyester or synthetic garments, there's microfiber shedding, which is tiny little plastics um, that are infiltrating our waterways, they're ending up in soils, in the atmosphere, um, really not good <laughs> places, places where we definitely don't want them to be. The stats with what's coming out of uh, what, you know, how many microplastics they're finding at the bottom of the ocean, and they've even found them in human blood, um, are really alarming. And uh, we don't have good solutions uh, for this at the moment because we need there's the two avenues that um, the experts I've spoken to advocate for are um, microfiber filters on washing machines to catch um, to catch the uh, microfibers before they end up in the waterways, which is the most effective way. But then they still need to be disposed of. So it's not a perfect solution because if they end up in landfill, there's still a risk of them ending up in the environment. And the flip side is um, advances in material innovation so that there's less shedding that happens on um, from each garment. So the worst offenders for this kind of thing are polo fleece. So, you know, the kind of Patagonia zip up jacket. So those are the kind of things that really shed a lot of microfibers, microplastics. But also um, they shed from our shoes, they shed when we walk, they shed, you know, so it's not a good solution to just only focus on, on the washing machine filters. Um, these just really aren't things that we should be wearing. And uh, my friend Alden Wicker, who's another sustainable journalist, has just written a book called To Die For, and it's about the toxic chemicals in our clothes. And um, I haven't read it yet, but she's told me that um, the you know, that she discovered some things about the toxicity of polyester um, and uh, that I think will really revolutionize this space because um, it's, uh, you know, this is kind of the next frontier for fashion, reckoning with the chemicals that are on our clothes that are getting absorbed through our skins, through our skin. Um, but the other thing that's important to know about polyester and synthetics is that when they get blended in with a natural fiber. So if you buy something that's like a cotton polyester blend, that's much harder to recycle. So in uh, the holy grail of the industry is only new garments coming from regeneratively farmed natural fibers. And then also um, uh, other materials coming from recycled fibers from all of the textiles that we already own. Um, right now, as the technology stands, it's much easier to recycle to recycle a mono material. So it's 100% wool, 100% cotton, 100% viscose, whatever it is. The moment it's blended, you make that equation much more complicated and you risk having an inferior um, product at the, on the other end because the fibers have to be chemically separated out so that they can each be recycled separately. So 
um, the prevalence of synthetic fibers in our clothes, either, you know, especially in blends is really problematic. And um, I've spoken to some um, expert recyclers who are, who are advocating for uh, blended materials to stop now, because if we want this holy grail in 10 years, in 20 years, we need to start stop producing clothes that are going to make that it that much harder for us to recycle them at the other end. So we really, um, I'm really looking forward to a future where we've eradicated all polyester from our wardrobes and, and, and from, you know, because the, the other thing about it is if we want to recycle all the polyester that we have now, which we do because it's a, you know, it's a valuable resource. We pulled it out of the ground, you know, that it was down there for 60 million years, hundreds of millions of years, maybe, uh, is that we should capture it and recycle it and turn it into things that are easier to capture and recycle on the other end. So put it into cars, put it into washing machines, put it into fridges, you know, like these big things that it's not um, as difficult as clothing to, to get that, to sort out, to figure what's in it, to, you know, to recycle it. So, um, yeah, there's some large scale solutions and I'm getting out of my wheelhouse now, but, um, but yeah, I'm definitely no more polyester. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I agree. No more, no more of that. It, it is a complicated industry. It's complicated period just as, uh, as food is, which is also my strong, strong suit. I, um, was recently in Thailand at a 20,000 square foot bamboo restaurant facility, like an experienced restaurant on, on this lake and the hundred percent made out of bamboo, but all the joints, all the tying together of the bamboo, they had used elastics from underwear, underwear bands and, and to tie all that together. And, and for every stitch of it, which is an, an, um, if you think about all the joints and how they connected this as into an actual structure, uh, um, a restaurant structure, it was amazing how, you know, and that's just one little place and, you know, uh, in, in Thailand, how complex uh, parts and pieces and blends of the clothing that we wear. I mean, I hope a lot of people wear underwear, or, you know, maybe, maybe it's not a good thing, but, but I know that, uh, in fast fashion and, and overall, we've got a lot of, uh, waistbands and, and products out there. So it, it's good to kind of take a look at what are we creating? Cause there is no place to, uh, there is no way on this planet. Everything that we throw away that we don't use, it remains here. So it needs to go back into reuse or be biodegradable to go back in our planet. And as you're talking about these other bad uh, fabrics, uh, you know, that we def spandex and different things, whatever, they, they don't really go right back into, uh, they're not biodegradable. And so we need to watch out. Have you answered um, the question fully of how uh, clothes made from natural fabrics, such as cotton wool, flax, cashmere, that that is the best way or one of the really good ways to support rural communities and regenerative landscapes? Or are there some things that you've left out, and maybe not told us about yet? Yeah, so in terms of um, <clears throat> uh, supporting rural communities, so we need, so farmers obviously, um, uh, you know, need to have products to sell to, to have a livelihood. So when the other benefit of regenerative agriculture is that it um, provides more steady income. So for example, in the book, um, I talked to Hilman Huey, who is um, the vice president of a silk company called Bombix. Um, and the way that they farm their silk is regeneratively. So um, uh, silk's a little of a kind of funny process to make. So basically what happens is they grow mulberry trees um, regeneratively in these fields in the hills in Nanchong in China. <clears throat> and the farmers harvest the leaves from the mulberry trees to feed the silkworms and the silkworms perform cocoons. And then the cocoon is what makes the silk. Um, but when I spoke to Hillman, he explained that 
the benefits of farming regeneratively this way for the farmers is <clears throat> multifaceted because previously <clears throat> they would have one crop a season and then they would have to leave their families and uh, one crop a year and go and farm somewhere else so, and then they were commuting long distances it wasn't so good for their health but when they switch to regenerative agriculture it means that beside the mulberry trees they're growing they're growing um spinach and other food that they can use to feed their families and then also to sell so their income for the year is steady and consistent because you've got these multiple different streams of uh, ways to earn money and so um, that allows them to have a much higher quality of life because you know um, it's a kind of a simple way of thinking about it but you know if they're close to home and the weather changes they just like you know, pop over across the field and they get, you know, their raincoat or their boots or their, you know, warm jumpers or, or whatever it is. Um, and it also allows, you know, to have this better kind of more powerful integration with their, with their family and their community. So um, it's not just financial, it's also the way that their lives are set up um, in, you know, and it, it's those two things kind of running together um, that really allow us to kind of see the positive benefits of, of regenerative agriculture, um, because I don't really think I explained before, but when we talk about reintroducing biodiversity in Regen Ag, um, <clears throat> what we're talking about is we're not planting fields and fields and fields beside each, uh, each other with just one crop. We're not just planting, you know, acres and acres of cotton uh, with no trees in sight. What you're doing is, you know, you're trying to integrate as many different species, uh, you know, into that field as possible. So you might have sunflowers besides a row of cotton beside a row of chickpeas beside you know mung beans or, or whatever it is and that multiple species diversity is what allows the soil health to thrive and function and so um you do that kind of example that i used in nanchong uh, you know is true for all of these different farming farming communities all over the world because it's subsistence you know they're able to feed their families and they're also able to make money from these different streams of crops plus they don't need to be spending money on the chemical fertilizers and, and pesticides. They've got healthier soils. They've got, they're not exposed to those um, dangerous chemicals themselves. So their um, physical health is also improved. And, you know, it really does, um, uh, you know, it, it does transform the, I don't want to speak for farmers because I'm not a farmer, but it does, you know, change the way that most farmers I know who switched to regenerative agriculture, it's changed their lives it, completely. Um, uh yeah so it it is this really and not to mention also that your yields improve over time so they're making you're making more money from the landscape than you were with synthetic chemicals and fertilizers because when you're doing your kind of profit equation if you take out this enormous expense and you're producing um <clears throat> as much uh as much of the same product, you, you know, you're making the same amount of money, you're making more money rather. Uh, um, so, but, uh, and, and then in addition to that, you can charge a higher premium because generally the quality of the fibers that you're getting from a regenerative landscape uh, are better. Say, for example, with a sheep that's been farmed regeneratively, that sheep is moving all over the farm. So it's the um, regenerative sheep farming involves this method called holistic grazing, which is about not staying on the same paddock. It's not, it's the opposite of set stocking where you would just put the herd of sheep on a paddock for six months at a time and they would eat the grass all the way down to the ground. With regenerative grazing, you're moving them every couple of days. So, so they're getting a diverse diet. The landscape is rich and flourishing and they're able to kind of, you know, eat everything as they're moving around. And what that does for their um, wool is it means that it grows, the um, continuity of the fiber is much smoother and more consistent because you don't have these drops where their nutrition has been affected because they've eaten all the grass or because, you know, it's winter and, and the, the landscape is barren. And so they've had to, you've had to bring in a, a different kind of uh, source of food. So you're getting, a, you're getting improved yields, a better profit margin, and then also a higher quality fiber, which means you can charge more for it again. So it is this, um, it's a, it can be a scary thing for farmers who've been farming industrially for a long time to, to kind of embrace, but it absolutely is 
um, the positive impacts of it in the long term just speak for themselves. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And you describe it so well. You, you don't have to be a, a farmer or regenerative uh, farmer, um, to, but you explained it very, very well. So Alan Savory, I know you work with the Savory Institute and that's where you get the holistic land management and regenerative grazing. And, and uh, uh, he was on the podcast, but he also wrote a section in my book. He's, he's a wonderful man and, and good person. And has really made a big improvement in, in the movement around uh, holistic land management and, and better practices all around, not only um, for regenerative agriculture, but for fashion, for, for many industries, for many things that just are the way that our world works. And um, it, it's crazy that we have to describe um, regeneration. You know, there's regenerative agriculture, of course, but there's regenerative medicine, there's regenerative fashion, there's regenerative economics. Uh, it's how our world works. We need to follow the seasons and allow life and our earth and our everything to regenerate itself, to kind of go through a time where, where you get some sleep and some rest and eat some food and, and regenerate yourself, you know, and, and uh, it's... We're not the only ones who function that way. Everything functions that way. And so I love how, how you describe that and, and, and that you touch on somebody who, uh, and some practices that, you know, really uh, championed by Alan Savory. Probably this is about as controversial as I get. It's not really controversial. It's kind of where I, I want to kind of, bounce some, since you're s such an expert, I want to bounce ideas and, and kind of have a discussion with you about it. There is a section in your book and, and you, you talk about the importance of buying less and, and you spoke about it in the beginning as well as, as we started out, kind of buying less, loving the clothes we own more, kind of reduce waste. And uh, for those skeptics would immediately say, oh, they're you know, reductionism. They want us to reduce. They want us to to consume less. And and there's people in the world they haven't had the opportunity to consume. They're still coming up in the. They're in developing countries that are still coming up, and they would like to have the chance to have a cell phone, or like to have the chance to have a cashmere outfit, or or you know to you know have a wool suit or or whatever it is. They they would like that opportunity. And now we're not even telling them that they get that opportunity. We're saying you need to reduce, so don't get it in the first place. And so um, how, how do we look at that reductionism? How does it help? And and and, um, and then then I want to kind of discuss a little bit more about that. If you tell us what your thoughts and in, in your, your opinions are on this and why this is what we need to do, and then I kind of want to discuss it a little bit more. Yeah, so look, you know, absolutely, it's something that we need to be aware of. I, I, I think, I feel <laughs> it's tricky because I, I, don't, I really truly passionately believe that this ability to consume the way that we have over the last two decades, three decades, has not made us happy. Um, but I'm also aware of the privilege of being, you know, a white lady from a wealthy country. Um, it's very easy for me to say that, um, whereas I know, you know, somebody that hasn't uh, had, you know, experienced this amount of privilege might be like, <laughs> yeah, to make you happy because you're miserable, but it would have made me happy. <laughs> Just give me the opportunity. Um, uh, you know, we're drowning in junk. Like, uh, you know, when I lived in Paris, it used to shock me because the homeless people were also drowning in junk. Like you would see, walk past them on the street and they would have a mattress covered in sleeping bags and clothes and other things. And, uh, you know, see them dragging these things around with them. And just because we have so successfully exploited, um, you know, communities and landscapes with less money than us, uh, we have created this proliferation of just too much stuff that, you know, 
is that is not fit for purpose and that is clogging up landfills all over the world and i don't what we would what i i think the solution would be to uh to the you know countries who have not had the opportunity to uh, you know make money and spend money the way that we have um we want i would hope that we would be able to offer them a better kind of consumption and a, um, a better path forward than than what we've had ourselves and i think part of that is um you know it, the the message in the book the message of sundressed it's not it I don't want anyone to feel shame around wanting to own a beautiful dress or, you know, wanting to feel good when they're walking down the street, because I think that um, these are real joys of life, this ability to express ourselves, um, this ability to appreciate beauty and the art that goes into making a garment. Um, uh, but capitalism and consumerism doesn't offer people those things. It offers people... Uh, overwhelmed by the amount of crap in their wardrobe and then shame and sadness because they don't want to wear any of it. And I don't, um, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't wish that on a developing, uh, somebody from a developing country who's, you know, who is fascinated by the, the way that we consume in the West because I think that it is extremely unhealthy. Um, and then the other side of the argument is that uh, the only way we're going to be able to continue to feed and clothe the world is if we save our soils and regenerative agriculture is the best way to do that. So while it will mean that we have to consume less overall, uh, hopefully it will mean that we can still offer, um, we can offer more, a more beautiful path forward for consumption and for um, for the fashion industry and for people who, who do want the opportunity to wear the cashmere outfit. You know, if we keep farming cashmere the way that we have been and producing too much of it, no one's going to get a cashmere outfit. We've got to rehabilitate those landscapes in Mongolia and China first. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we'll move our way forward to a more equal world so that uh, it's not just you know, Australians and Americans, we consume more clothes than anybody else in the world and we throw more clothes away as well. And that's that's a sickness. Like that's not a that's not a, a thing that we should be proud of and, and it's not something anybody should aspire to at all. We we the system's broken, we need to we need to fix it. I absolutely agree that the system is broken and, and we do need to fix it. Um the the reason I kind of talk about the consumerism or this reductionism as well as I honestly believe that and, and we talked about this uh, um, kind of in the beginning as well I think it's about the way we produce and what we produce so it's it's not it's not the brands of the future it's not the you know the, the you know the Panagonias or Gucci's or whatever brands you want you want to mention um, in the future. I think it's how we produce garments or fashion, period, that will have the biggest impact or produce anything in our world that will have the biggest impact on the future. And so to kind of like I said, it's very similar to the the. Uh, bottling industry, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, or whatever, Unilever, big bottlers of beverages, you know, I don't think we told them, hey, let give us plastic bottles. They just did. And if, if we can have fashion production that is run on renewable energy without greenhouse gas emissions, with organic inks, and without chemicals and, and pesticides and fertilizers and processes in that production and manufacturing and sewing with a fair wage and a labor run on renewable energy and gray water recycling, black water recycling, rainwater harvesting, ambient water harvesting, um, all, any, any and every possible production manufacturing process that we can that is nudging more towards regeneration and renewables and towards those futures that 
do no harm, leave the planet better than we found it without creating this ripple effect down the line and say, but we need people to buy more. So we're going to produce it as cheap as we can with the worst type of things. And we just churn it out. And then whatever doesn't sell, then we throw away or ruins our world. Uh, I think it's virtually impossible if we do the good production way to to churn out a bad product, a bad product for the environment, a bad product for humanity. Uh, and so I actually think that uh, why are we made responsible and have to consume less because of the shitty producers of fashion? And so that's kind of the debate I wanted to get in is why, why instead of saying, instead of consuming shitty products or consuming less, why can't I put the onus back on the producers who are producing that to say, you know, I don't, I don't want that anymore. I don't want you to produce it anymore. Um, uh, it's your job. It's not my job to recycle it. I, that's why I pay you. I want you to do it right in the first place. And so I don't know if you understand kind of fully yet what I'm trying to get on a debate, but I'd like to get your opinions or your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, the, the bad act is the guys that make a lot of money by using, you know, shitty production methods, um, they're in it for themselves. So there's, there's, they've got, there's no appetite from those big players in the industry um, to really curb their carbon footprint. They're interested in being able to say they're curbing their carbon footprint so they can sell more clothes. Um, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, what we really need, I guess, is government regulation. You know, if we want, if we want um, the worst players in the industry to change, we can't sit around and expect that they'll do it themselves. There's no um, motivation, you know, they don't have that self-motivation because they're, they're looking at their profit margins and they're looking at their bottom line. You know, I had a conversation with the sustainability um, head of sustainability at H&M um, and he was like, we are trying to, you know, H&M does a lot of work in this space trying to become more sustainable. But at the end of the day, they produce billions of garments every year. And um, until they stop doing that, they're not going to, they're, they're not going to curb their carbon footprint. So when I put that to him, he said, what we're trying to do is decouple our um, economic growth and our production from um, raw materials. So what, you know, what he means is they are basically looking to, uh, looking forward to a world where they can continue producing this much, but they're only doing it from recycled materials. Look, and it, it's, uh, sure, I'm like on board. If you, if you can use green energy to recycle the amount of garments you're putting out there into the world and uh, have a truly neutral carbon footprint. Um, sure, I'm, I'm on board. It, how realistic is that? When at the moment, I think the stat is, it, it's like 200 billion garments a year and um, what they're recycling is like 145 million or something. So it's a really tiny, tiny fraction of the I've, I've got those numbers wrong, um, but it, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of, of the overall um, amount. And that is because you cannot guarantee that somebody is going to give you back the T-shirt when they're done with it. So as long as you're putting out the garments, you can, um, ex without a proper system for collection, you have to assume that those garments are going to end up getting disposed of in a way that means those resources are lost. There is one company I know who has um, created a recyclable um, sneaker, which is on a subscription service. And this is a truly circular model. So you pay $30 a month and they send you your first pair of sneakers and you run in them and you wear them. And once you've worn them out, you email them and you send in another pair, they send you another pair and you send your old ones back and they are working towards uh, yeah, amazing, right? A system where every that's sneaker so total amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, yeah, huge. I'm a huge fan. I can't get on the subscription service because they don't offer it in Australia, <laughs> and I'm really annoyed. But um, yeah, but that's that's realistic, right? Because uh, the sneaker is made from one type of plastic, so they can shred it, they can melt it down. There's a little component that um, can't be recycled, but 
yeah, okay, then you've got a system where you're guaranteeing you're getting the product back, you're capturing those resources and you're turning them into something new. With the H&M uh, model, uh, there's no incentive for customers to bring back their clothes. I think maybe at one point, they, they, maybe they offer some vouchers if you drop them off at the store, but they are offering you a voucher so that you buy something, uh, you know, something else new that's not made from the recycled materials. I don't want to say that they're not going to get there because they have a lot of money and I want to believe and I, we need the big players if we want to ch transform this industry. So I don't believe in trying to cancel H&M and trying to cancel Zara because I would, you know, love to see those kind of great minds that figured out how to turn around, you know, Paris runway designs into, you know, cheap high street fashion in a matter of weeks. Um, really truly take on uh, sustainability and help us transform the industry. Um, you know, we need a wide tent, a broad tent, whatever the saying is. So, um, so, so yeah, but look at the moment with the way that H&M is operating, um, the, the current practices are not matching up with the long-term intentions because if they really wanted to be circular, they'd stop producing blends and they'd just make everything out of mono materials. And, you know, that would be, that would take them halfway there. Yeah. It's a, it's about how they produce and it's, it's really um, up to them. It's in, in their hands, hands to do it. And um, their model won't suffer for it. There will still be the demand uh, for, for the, the products and, and they've already got the market so if they switch so no we're going to be 100 percent good for the earth and for everybody then it's just it's a win-win but it's a it's a hard it's a hard sell and i i agree on that i i lean more towards uh, um <clears throat> i think if we do it with a better production standard so we do it to 100 percent the way it should be the way maybe we, I don't know if it was intended that way when we first started making clothes, but the way it should be done right, regenerative fashion, I, I think we could have abundance. I, I think you could if you wanted to hoard clothes and buy a bunch of stuff because it wouldn't hurt anybody because, you know, if you threw it away or it wouldn't hurt our environment, it wouldn't hurt our world. In the process of making it, it wouldn't create emissions in that. And so I think... Um, that that would be the better way but anyway um companies like pantagonia caring and lvmh you know they're they're just working with farmers supply chains to transition to this regenerative agriculture pantagonia what they've done i love what vaughn from from uh, pantagonia has done he just basically said our only sharehold is mother earth our only shareholder is earth period it doesn't matter what the bottom line is. And there, I mean, he's not seeing any more CEO anymore. He's uh, given it over, but what a mission, what a, what a process to say, don't buy our clothes, buy reuse, let's get, take it and fix it up and do different things. And I really think we, we need to use a different operating system in, in, um, in fashion and in everything we do. Um, to, to make that change and you really address it. And you also speak about Pantagonia in the book. Um, I don't know if that's the best example, but I liked it. I liked the story uh, quite a bit. And, and uh, can you tell us kind of why you see this trend? It, and, and also, I guess one last little nudge in there to throw in an extra one. Do you think regeneration as a trend or has it been around forever? We just been blind to the fact. Of, of regeneration yeah so um so definitely regeneration has been around forever <laughs> uh indigenous communities have been using i don't want to speak, speak about indigenous communities like they're a monolith there are indigenous communities around the world who have been using regenerative farming techniques and working take, take care of the landscape um forever for sure absolutely um and it, it was actually also something that um, Western farmers were doing up until the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, Andre Voisson, who is um, one of the, um, uh, like he was he, similar to Savory. I think Savory drew on some of his techniques um, when he was developing his um, regenerative grazing method. He's French, you know, so it's not just, uh, it's, it, it's, it's all of us. There was periods of time throughout um, 
humanity where we worshipped nature and it wasn't until kind of the enlightenment and things started to change that we we put god as we put man as god as opposed to mother earth as god and so um it's not that long ago we can get back there because i think it sounds like a much happier place to be for sure um and Yvonne Chouinard is kind of a great example of somebody who worships Mother Earth. You know, his story is um, is pretty amazing and inspiring. You know, he started out just he started out just wanting to surf and and climb <laughs> and be in nature. Um, and literally, Patagonia started because he didn't like the um, little um, pistons that were available um, for mountain climbing. Uh, he didn't like that you um, left them in the rock face, so he wanted to invent one that you could take out and reuse and and he did it himself and then started making them out the back of his car and then you know slowly expanded and um was just selling them and surfing and sleeping you know under under trees and and these kind and that kind of stuff for you know for most of his 20s and then it wasn't until um they started kind of entering into clothes because he was i think he was on a trip i i haven't um read his book for a while and he discovered um you know, this kind of canvas short, they call it the stand up short. And he was like, this would be great for mountain climbing. And then he started importing rugby, um, rugby jumpers and other things. And so Patagonia really was this organic beginning of somebody who just wanted to make things that allowed other people to be close to nature and to experience how wonderful and beautiful it is. So what do I, I so I, I guess, you know, that, that being the basis for the Patagonia company and then his kind of approach as a businessman, this kind of rogue, um, let my people go surfing is his company, is the company motto. So the idea is that you can come into the office whenever you want, as long as you get your work done. And that also means you can go and surf when the, when the water's good, <laughs> the waves are good. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's a, a really beautiful sentiment and uh you know they've always invested a portion of their profits into um wildlife um uh, preservation and he's had some really unique kind of special business practices one of my favorite lines from his book is every time we chose to do the right thing over the cost effective thing it ended up saving us money in the long term and the example that he's talking about in in that instance is um, deciding to put a childcare centre on the main campus for Patagonia's um, head office so that uh, they, they would have better retention of their female staff. And his accountants were like, this isn't worthwhile you doing this. Um, and he was like, well, I, I want to do it anyway. And he said in the long run, because it means that they get to, you know, keep their staff and that everybody's happier and um, everybody has a better work balance. It's saved them a lot of money and on recruitment and retraining and, and all these other things. So um, there's a real kind of hopeful, powerful message in there. But I, I do need to say <laughs> um, Patagonia, as much as they are doing really good work, especially in a regenerative sp um, space, um, they use too much polyester. And so I write about them in the context of the hemp chapter because they are working to bring hemp farming and processing back to um, the U.S. Unfortunately, and hemp's an amazing fiber. Hemp, um, it, it grows really fast. It's got really long roots, so it's really, really good for soil health. Uh, it grows without pesticides, fertilizers. You know, it's it's just, it's a wonderful crop. And we should, it should be much more widespread. It also produces a really wonderful fiber, similar to linen. But, and it sequesters twice as much carbon as a forest when you're planted over the same amount of space. And because you can harvest it twice a year, you can effectively sequester four times as much carbon as one forest in a year, which is amazing. Um, but every hemp product on the Patagonia website has been blended with polyester. And as I talked about before, that blend compromises its ability to be recycled and also your experience when you're wearing it. So, and they're aware of that. They are trying to use more recycled polyester, but um, at the moment, recycled polyester is actually just um, downcycled plastic. So it's not a perfect solution. And Yvonne Chouinard has said at different times that the company has gotten too big. Um, and, it's very difficult to be able to control your supply chain when you're producing that many t-shirts and that many um, pairs of pants and all these other things. But 
in terms of what I was saying before about needing the big players, we need the we need people who know how to make money to be investing in these solutions because we're not going to get there if we like turn our back on <laughs> on anybody who's got any kind of financial cap on everybody that's got any kind of financial capital. Um, their worn wear program is really great where they will always, um, where they do uh, repairs um, for um, broken Patagonia products. There's a lot of good, um, but even when they say that they're recycling garments, I found at the bottom of their 2019 financial report, a little paragraph that said, because we can't do textile to textile recycling at the moment, actually all of the clothes are just sitting in a warehouse in storage, waiting for somebody to, build the infrastructure to be able to do it so look the intentions are there and i don't want to say that they're you know the devil because they're absolutely not i and i love the example of the company no, that um, you and i just created but I, I think it's important to hedge it because otherwise um you know knowledge is power yeah, there's there's a, there is something behind uh, behind the curtain for sure and i i think they probably trying to do the best they can uh at a point, but I think there is also uh, always more that we can do and, and just st step it up. And I don't think um, any company is perfect. I think we're all on a journey. It's really hard to do. Uh, the problem is, is we got to keep doing right. And even, um, you know, one, one big example was the diesel gate, what happened with Volkswagen, but yet to the, they're the they're the first car company to come out with plant based fuels and electric vehicles and and different things. Um, you know the first electric vehicle was nineteen thirty two or eighteen thirty two. Sorry, and uh, just unbelievable uh, how that's been around. Then they had diesel gate, but now they're going gangbusters trying to do a lot of positive. And so I think there is a way to change and improve and. And, and, and to learn. And, and in that process, in your book, you kind of give us a couple of tips uh, on how we can ta tackle climate change without shaming people, without saying, oh, the devil, the damn people, for, uh, and specifically the consumer for loving beautiful things who want to buy clothes and the beautiful dresses and suits and things like that. What's your advice? Yeah, look, I, th I think it's, uh, it's really important to embrace beauty and, and especially in fashion, because when you own something beautiful, you take care of it, you appreciate it. And it really, um, I think it can be a really powerful tool for us reconnecting with and slowing down um, our patterns of consumption um, and reconnecting with the, with things that really do bring us joy. Because when we want to tap out of um, this kind of, um, toxic cycle of consumerism we need to do so in a way that is that still feels exciting and still feels fun and still feels sexy and um and like you can still you know kind of um we need to embrace the most persuasive parts of the fashion industry which are those tools and use them in the fight against climate change so it's really uh, uh important to me <laughs> when i'm having these conversations that People understand I'm not talking about wearing a hemp sack. I'm talking about wearing a really beautiful garment that you want to keep and wear and that you walk down the street in and that you feel really good in because I know from my personal experience that those are the garments that I keep and I wear for a really long time and that I want to reach for in my wardrobe again and again. And because fashion exists in this psychological space for all of us where we, um, you know, we want to look good we want to fit in and we want to be able to get dressed in the morning and feel comfortable and not be stressed about it. If, if we can kind of hit on all of those points, um, that's a sustainable wardrobe, you know, a beautiful, comfortable wardrobe that where we love everything. Uh, that's not, a, that's not, then you're in a state where you're not reaching for the next new cheap thing all the time um, and disposing of it equally because you bought it and you regret it and you don't care about it anymore. So um, I, I do um, strongly advise <laughs> that we um, put shame around consumption to one side, but also that we in, that we transform the way that we are consuming. And when we recognize the beauty in a garment, you kind of want that beauty to extend all the way through to the source of its raw materials. So when we're talking about uh, regenerative um, 
beautiful regenerative knit made from regenerative wool, we're talking about wool that's come from a landscape that is also extremely beautiful. And that kind of um, is where we start to value what's happening in the world and in the, in our environment, which is really precious and really, you know, full of wonder and awe, and also take that, uh, that desire to protect that and apply it to, you know, our garments that are equally as precious and coming from, you know, uh, because they're beautiful and they've come from this beautiful landscape. So it's this kind of um, uh, circular way of thinking. And yeah, I, I really truly believe that if we sit in that space, um, we can transform the fashion industry. <laughs> I do believe that too. You convinced me. I I <laughs> I don't know how much you know about me. Uh, I know you you were referred to me by Island Press, and they really sung your praises highly. But I have been speaking about environment and climate and and agriculture and, and regeneration for a long time, for over two decades. And the biggest frustration, I mean, one of my, one of my kind of uh, uh, signatures is I love to wear Levi's denim, you know, these, these old uh, uh, pearl, pearl button uh, denim jeans, uh, I guess, shirts, and um, I'm addicted to them. And that's been my standard for a long time, really, because they're just comfortable and uh, I don't, I have struggled so much to put a, a, a thought into what's, what's sustainable. And in your book, you talk about denim and um, that it is pretty, pretty sustainable overall. Um, so I, I'd love for you to touch upon that, but I really wanted to say, I, I'm always looking where, where are the sustainable fashions? I want to t not only talk about it on the stage, but I want to wear something that's kind of sustainable. So I was an ambassador for Eco Al for a while. They, they, they recycle fishing nets and, and do some stuff, but I wasn't really pleased with the quality of those clothes and, and, and the materials. And then I found, um, and I switched, which was kind of weird. I found a company here locally in Hamburg, Germany. It's called Thomas Punkt, and they have a, they make suits locally, but they're not the suits that we might think of. They're more like architect designer suits, very casual, leisure, uh, all handmade, all hand sewn here. The, uh, I, I hope that they're not lying to me. Most of the the fabrics and things are sourced locally or sourced from places that are well thought out and they know the supply chain. Um, from the discussions I have, one's a wool suit and the other one's a cotton suit. Um, uh, a thicker kind of like a very heavy duty like workwear cotton, but yeah. And so I'm, I'm really happy with that, but I'd like to kind of get your thing that I've never researched on the denim aspect yeah, so look, denims, uh, I love denim, as you could probably tell from reading the chapter on, on Levi's in my book. Um, I, I, it's tricky because, you know, when you go and look, I probably don't need to tell you, but, you know, when you go and look at vintage denim, um, especially denim from that era when Levi's was first starting out and he was making denim jeans from American cotton and it was all grown in America and then manufactured in America. Um, and there are some, you know, um, I'm in LA, I'm going to go and look at some vintage stores today and I'm really hoping to find some. It, the, the denim is thick. It is thick and rigid and, and you, you know, you can see that someone's really had to wear it in. And now what we buy when we buy jeans is like, you know, jeans that have literally been deliberately aged, you know, they've been stonewashed, which is like, Pumicing them with stones or treated with chemicals to make them soft. And that's not what I want when I'm buying denim. I want it to be, I want to feel like I'm going to keep it and have to like really, you know, do my time breaking it in. Um, so uh, I, I don't have, uh, citizens of humanity are actually probably the best ones just off the top of my head. So they're a denim brand and they've just started a regenerative cotton project. Um, and I know that the quality of those clothes are pretty good. 
Um, but I let me have some time to think about it and I'll, and I'll get back to you. Um, cause you probably, I I, I, some I, tricks cause like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I have a sense of what you, of what you probably want. And I, I think I have a look at citizens of humanity. I feel like that's probably a good place to start, but in that particular space, you know, I, I find it really hard to go past. I know it's like such a cliche to say to buy vintage if you want to buy sustainable, but that's where you're going to find the most exciting quality, you know, and the, and the, the details that are, you know, probably the things that you weren't happy with, with the, with the other brand, because they weren't blending anything with polyester, you know, they weren't putting fake rips in and, and stuff. They just were making workman's clothes that had to last because, you know, you didn't have the resources and the production, you know, everything to, to buy more than one pair at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are the lines that I like the most recently, like Patagonia has a workwear and, and Carhartt yeah. does and many others are coming out with these workwear lines so that you can actually get back and do something again. And, and, you know, as I mentioned, I do a lot with agriculture and that. So I always, I like to be outdoors. I like to get dirty. And so, but uh, I, the, the other thing that I've been real fortunate of and people think I'm crazy. Um, I still have clothes from junior high school that I've had altered or changed, or if the, something rips, I fix them. And, and the reason I have them is they look brand new. They're fabulous clothes. They last forever. And um, people are like, oh, throw that away. And I said, I've had that forever. I've got memories from when I was in junior high school from that. You know, and so it's, it's interesting. There's a different uh, respect for quality clothing. There's a different uh, feeling that you get when, when you've had a journey, you've broken that in, you like the way it feels, you like the way it looks. And people don't say, gosh, you look like you're out of the 80s, you know. <laughs> so that's interesting. I have two last questions for you. Um, uh, this this next one's the hardest one that you'll have today. It's mm -hmm. the one that I ask all my guests because it has to do with our future and environmentalism and, and, and many other things, but what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not oh. for me, not for your spouse, for you. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Okay. I, um, wow, this is a big question. I actually have been thinking about this a little bit because now I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, so I'm writing all the time and I can write from anywhere. So I have a lot of, uh, a lot of freedom. Um, I'm not making as much money as I would be if I, you know, become a lawyer or, or an engineer or something like that, but I have a very high quality of life. Um, and uh, obviously there's a, an, a, an amount of privilege in that, but also there's an element of, I, you know, I live pretty simply. Um, and so I think it, there is this hamster wheel that we're all on where we've got nine to five jobs and we're showing up in offices and, you know, working really long hours and, you know, you know, it's still very hard in this kind of economy to get ahead I, I do believe we need a really fundamental rethink and restructure uh, for the way that our lives are set up. And, you know, part of that is a return to, you know, being more self-reliant. So being less kind of addicted to a big wage and growing our own food, you know, um, taking better care of the garments that we have and consuming less so that we're not kind of so inundated with, with clutter. Um, and also having more time to spend with, you know, friends and family and, you know, slowing down and doing things that we enjoy rather than, um, you know, this kind of heavy emphasis on, on career and work. And the thing about the way that our economy is structured so that so much wealth is pulled at the top, I do believe we, for that for what I just outlined to be a reality, we need a fundamental redistribution of that 
of that wealth. And so I don't know if it's a universal basic income or, you know, something, something similar, but um, when the world is so abundant and there is so much to go around, it, it's a, a real shame that um, we're all too busy to enjoy it. Does that answer that I question? Love that. That's, uh, no. Yeah. It's, there's, there, there's a similar right answers. I've, I've asked about 3,500 people that question and, uh, and only had seven answer where I've gotten a similar answer, which is very telling in and of itself. But I, I love your answer. It's very unique. And, and the reason it's so important is because you're, what I hear is we need to get back to, to live in life. And, and I, I've had this discussion quite a bit as we, for, for decades, we've heard this, um, and sorry, it's bullshit, this work-life balance. There is no work-life balance. There's only life. And, and, and if we don't, if, if work, work is part of life, but it's all one thing. It's if you're different in your life than you are at your work, then you're probably bipolar or schizophrenic because you're doing two different things, probably going in two different directions. They're all one thing. And, and the, the life thing that keeps everything else going. And if we, if, if we, we mess that up, then, then it's not. And so that's what I hear. And I think your answer is so beautiful. It's wonderful. And you're right on, on that. And, and that's what we're seeing everybody doing in the pandemic and coming out and moving forward in the future. They want to have a good life. They want to have, they make, make sure that they do it right. And then it's around for next future generations and themselves to enjoy. Um, mm. the, the, the last question I have is really if, uh, <clears throat> with all your experience and things that you've learned so far in this journey of life, what, ha what would you have loved to know from the start? Oh, <laughs> well, this is, they're so philosophical, these last questions. Um, I guess that uh, we're not really in control. So um, taking the time to kind of surrender to the journey and pay close attention because the universe will, will give you the little signs along the way about, you know, little warnings, little indicators when things are going right, when you're on the right track. Um, and maybe to just kind of relax a little bit more. <laughs> Lucianne, thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas. Sundressed is, is your book. I love it. It's a fabulous book. I recommend it to everybody to read. It really gives you insights of, of what's going on in our world and some wonderful tips of what we can do to, to do it better. And thank you for my personal tip because I'm definitely going to look there. I'm going to follow up because I want some more. I need those good tips. Thank you very much. And that's all I have. If you there's nothing else that you would like to add. No, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. It's nice to have such thoughtful questions and to really go deep. It's not often that I do an interview that lasts this long. <laughs> so, so thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope to see you again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.